Hello, everybody, and welcome to the show. This is Multifamily Chronicles, and I'm your host, Adrian Danila. Today, I have with me uh, Faizan Khan. Faizan is the CEO of Let Hub. Welcome to the show, Faizan. Thanks, Adrian. Thanks for taking the time, and excited to be here. So, Faizan, I want to start by introducing you to the audience. Uh, please tell us a little bit about yourself and also about your very interesting journey as a founder and CEO. I understand that you are on your startup number three. Yeah, uh, no, for sure. So I am sort of like this, this word has been thrown out a lot and I'm sort of one of those, um, I fall in that category. I'm more of like a serial entrepreneur. Um, started very early in, uh, after graduating. I did an accounting and finance degree and I didn't quite like it. So uh, for me, technology was the main thing since I was a kid. I was doing a lot of things and inventing a few things here and there. Um, yeah, so I started off, uh, I, I started my first company, I think when I was 20. Uh, or, or And it was like a great experience for me. Uh, we grew from a, a company of two people in, a, in an actual garage. It was an actual garage that we used. And we went from there to uh 30 people in a slightly bigger office and uh we did it in 18 months um this was back in the day i think it was like 20, 2009 10 after the financial crisis and it was a, a an amazing <clears throat> experience for for me uh the first experience i had no idea about startups or entrepreneurship i just wanted to uh build things and sell things um uh and mostly online so yeah, we did that. And then uh, I had a successful exit and I started another company, which is like a removable marquee company. And um, and after and after selling that, I decided that I wanted to uh, move to Canada uh, and went to Victoria, which is on the West Coast, close to Seattle and Vancouver. And um, I moved there and then um, I was having problems with finding a place to live. Uh, the whole system was so like, uh, archaic it was just like really old and uh, finding a place wasn't as easy so then I decided that I want to solve this problem make it make the whole experience for a renter looking for a condo or an apartment uh, super easy uh, and you know that's how we started we built a few um, got a team together and like built a few MVPs raised some money and then you know here we are um, a few years down the line and now um we're solely focused on building amazing ai products for uh the multifamily and third party uh industry so overall uh, quite a bit of a journey and uh comes with a lot of experience and i have uh, given what the times are these days with the high inflation and all that i have seen two of these times uh, in my career um one was the financial crisis and after that, the oil crisis, and then I've seen COVID, and now I'm seeing this whole inflation crisis. And you know, countries like Germany and big big countries or small countries are, you know, close to bankruptcy and all of that stuff. So, yeah, uh, seen quite a bit. But uh, I'm sure there's lots to learn and long ways to go. So yeah, excited to share my thoughts about uh, multifamily. Yeah, so uh, t tell us a little bit more about uh, Let Hub. What do you guys do over there? What what type of uh, yeah, for sure you're developing, and you know what type of services you're providing for the industry? Yeah, for sure. So our Let Hub, our our main goal is to completely automate top of the funnel, um, uh, for for a multifamily uh management company. For example, um, we. In, a, in layman's terms, what we do is that whenever someone's interested in your properties and they want to inquire about it through all of these listing websites, Zillow, Zumber, and, all, and Apartments.com, when they go there and they submit an inquiry, our goal is to completely automate the uh, communication that happens between a renter and a leasing agent, but at the same time, give the leasing agents a tool where they can perform better and increase their efficiency. So responding to tenants, answering their questions, booking and scheduling tours. If you have a uh, fewer short on staff and your showing agents are running around town making doing showings and you don't have on-site managers, then uh, we take care of that, right? You connect your calendars. Let's say you have, even if you have a hundred leasing agents, you connect your calendars. 
and our smart AI system knows exactly when to book a tour. Um, it cuts the step of like uh, the the actual step that a renter takes where I'm available at these times. Are you available? And then the renters us to wait. No, you don't need to wait. You just hit the time you have access to the calendar directly for a leasing agent. Um, so answering questions is a big part. Like people, 80% of the time people are asking questions around, you know, parking or uh, pets and things like that. And a lot of the amenity questions, floor plans and so on. So our goal is to answer that over email, text, a chat bot, whatever channel, or, or maybe like a phone, if you still use a phone service, um, any kind of channel that um, you get an inquiry from, we will store that information, respond to people, book tours, and also follow up. Follow up is very important in this industry, and we've seen uh, a higher conversion rate. And uh, customized follow-ups over text and email, all of that is comes into a package and like, it then integrates with your property management software. So the Blood Hub, basically in a nutshell, will take care of all of that while you see what's happening and while you respond. If you want to jump in, you can. Um, and then, you know, that's why you get a higher conversion rates. And then metrics. Metrics is very important. Um, we look at everything from how people are visiting your website to are they converting? And if not, then what kind of follow-up is required? And also collecting feedback from people, like how was their visit? Uh, did they like the visit? Did they like the customer service? Did they like the location? Did they like the place? What did they not like about it? Was it the price? What Whatever it was. Um, so like a full top of the funnel product, um, let up is evolving into and building new things. And now we released uh, a self-showing technology as well. You take a selfie, you take a picture of your ID, and you can enter the unit if you don't have a leasing agent, and then you know fill out the rental application online. So the whole uh, initial process, like completely automating that, and then we'll move on to bigger things like maintenance and and so on. So there's mo a lot to do for us uh, for the next five years, and I'm seeing a lot new, crazy new technology being built in this space. So you mentioned maintenance. Uh, my background in multifamily is mainly maintenance and maintenance management. Uh, is this something that you're considering in the future, like building some products that are uh, applying to maintenance, to the maintenance process? Yeah, I mean, I um, as much as I can share, uh, one of the things that I'm seeing um, in this industry is that there are good maintenance, decent ma maintenance products, but they require a lot of manual work. Um, and some of the products have some automation, but it still needs direct supervision. And because maintenance directly affects your turnover, uh, if you're not providing good service, people will leave. Um, then I think what, what, what needs to be done is, uh, instead of taking AI and putting it into maintenance, and basically just like shoving AI into maintenance and then figuring out where to use AI or does it actually save money and time and so on. Um, instead, uh, people like companies are focusing on that. I think it should be the other way around where understanding what are the top 10 problems that some a maintenance coordinator has or a person whoever manages the maintenance in a, in a big or small company. And where does AI fit in? Instead of let's fit AI in maintenance, let's fit maintenance in AI. So, um, and and I think that's where we're heading. Um, we as a company are looking at the crazy number of hours that are spent just managing the pipeline, just moving things from a request has come in uh, to actually it being actioned because there needs to be some follow-up uh, and feedback. A lot of it is manual, although there's some good tools out there. I think the AI can be trained in a way where it mimics the leasing or the maintenance coordinator and then um, do a lot of the tasks that they're doing so that they have they have more time and it's it's 24 seven and it's highly efficient. And they can jump in whenever is required. Understanding the problem is very important. I think that's sort of 
where we're heading instead of just making AI products for the sake of it. So he, here's something that I'm noticing, uh, and this comes from me as being a executive, from me being <laughs> a end user from both angles, right? So I give you two angles here. Um, typically tech companies will hire, you know, people that are great at writing code and also <laughs> pe people that are great at selling products. Mm -hmm. And they think that that's sufficient for their product to be successful. And I think that's true, but, but there's a missing piece right there that I'm seeing on most of the apps that I'm ex I've been exposed to. And the missing mm -hmm. piece is where do you take the end user experience and use that to make the best product out there? Mm -hmm. Because you, you, you yourself, you, I'm assuming, right? I'm on assume and correct me if I'm wrong. Have you ever done maintenance? Me, myself, no, never. Okay, so you haven't done. Uh, are, yeah. are people that are writing your code, did they did they ever, do they have a maintenance background for the most part? No. They, they do not. So that missing piece is, you know, the end user experience, the, yep. the, the experience that comes from doing it with your own hands. And, you know, it's a person like me or, you know, a technician on site or someone that could articulate what they yep. like or don't like about the products, yours or anybody else's you know, put it on their phone and they could play with it and tell you like, this is not the way it works in real world. Like yep. it's supposed to work this way. And this yep. way they, they help you develop a product that's actually tailored towards the end user, uh, not just focused on let's make the gray sell because we gonna get, you know, a lead to the CEO, of, you know, whatever management company, and we gonna make a sell. A lot of times, you know, that's successful in itself because you could, you know, sell to a large number of units. But ultimately what I'm seeing, and I, I witnessed, I was part of that where I was director of maintenance and somebody else in a company higher up picked a product that was maintenance related with no feedback from me at all. And then what we noticed, you know, months down the road is that, you know, there are like ten, uh, thousands and thousands of tasks that are in incompleted, not completed because the adoption rates were minimal. Yep. And everybody freaks out saying, well, why... People aren't complying. Well, you know, did you have them? A, did you give them a chance to play with it to tell you what's you know what they like, what they don't like? How do you get the buy-in from the end user? So, yep. I, I like to hear your thoughts on you know what I just said. You know, getting someone, getting some uh, uh, industry uh, experts, right, and from the end user perspective to enhance this experience from yep. uh, from from that perspective. What, yep. what do you think? No, for sure. I think in bigger tech companies and small tech companies, they both have the same problem. They're delusional. When you build products, you think the customer would like it this way. You see Apple do that as well. Sometimes they make a release, a software update, and people are like, I don't like this button. So um, it's I think a lot of the time, the best way to go about things, because everyone's got their own way of doing things, is it's to actually build a custom solution for the more like an MVP, like a, like a minimum uh, viable product for a customer while working with them and for about preferably on site with them and collecting all the requirements like a consultant and building and testing, building and testing and iterating and reiterating until you get to the point where everyone, all the stakeholders involved in maintenance, for example, are happy with it. Once one company is happy, you'll figure out that you'll, 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 you'll actually learn a lot and then you'll figure out that, okay, the other companies are also uh, have the same sort of mindset or uh, they like the product. A, this is a typical UX a user experience design uh, thing that a lot of companies don't um, focus on. Um, and I've seen this, multiple times now uh, where uh, not talking to users and uh, enhancing your product is uh, is almost like a sin and uh, that you're you're basically messing up the next six months of develop development and six months is a lot um, you're building things that people don't really understand or like or or will be able to use so I completely agree with you is um, even we are tech guys, we can build things. We are really good at project management and uh, delivery. 
we understand technology um better than the maintenance guys but the maintenance people are going to be the end users the users so keeping them in mind feeding their persona how do they spend their day what are the tasks that they do what do they hate what do they like um how are they going to use this product do the do the actual maintenance people the vendors are they going to be using this product if they don't use it to get give an update then it's useless right so uh, how do they usually give updates? Do they have an internet connection when they're giving updates, when the plumber goes in, or do they just want to have a text, right? Do they have a text update. Do they want a phone update? So like figuring out how the industry works and then just building around it and building a very tight knit, a tight, like sort of like an MVP product while working with a company, in my opinion, I think is way more, uh, we're a good efficient way of going about things. And that's how we do it at Lera. Um the first five customers we had uh, signed up when we didn't have a product. So I used to go to their office and take all the requirements and come back and get my team to build it. Then we'll go back again, do a demo. And they were like, no, I think it should be this way. And they will do a practical. We'll take out our building. And yeah, it's like the early days of LetHub where we said no to so many things that the team thought that people wanted. But then we just build what people are. Well, for example, we we hate calls, right? We we don't believe that someone should pick up the phone to see a, a unit. The future is going to be all online and it is still. And you can see with chat GPT and all that stuff. Uh, if you want to go and check your bank account, you don't go and stand in line or call someone. You just open the app and you look check your account balance. Or you do, I don't know, you deposit a check, you take a picture. Um. So we believe in the future, but real, but we realized that 10% of the intake was actually coming through calls. So we had to build a call uh, integration. Like when you call, you get a nice IVR message and then you can book a tour. Um, yeah, so things like these where uh, practicality me, meets the dreamers and then, you know, some hybrid product uh, sort of comes out. Uh, long answer to your short question, but yeah, I... I I truly believe customer first start with a customer and work backwards. <clears throat> You're building AI products, uh, mainly. It's what I'm understanding, right? Uh, I'm curious about your take on uh, the role of AI in, yep. you know, in in our present, in a present, in our industry, and the role of AI in a future. Is AI going to be replacing jobs in the multifamily sector? Is it already doing that? How, how do you see the present and the future regards to to uh, to AI? Yeah, so AI is overplayed in our industry. Um, a lot of the products that are, quote, air quotes AI, are actually not real AI products or true AI, as they say. They are more decision tree products. When this happens, do that. Like click here, click here, click here. Um, there are very few real AI products that are actually being trained. Building an AI engine for communication, for example, takes a lot of data input. You need to feed it data so it be becomes smarter and smarter and smarter with time, and then then you know mimics a leasing agent or mimics a reporting analyst or mimics a maintenance coordinator, whatever it is it's almost like a child you have to feed more information and becomes like an adult as they go through school or whatever it is. Think of it that way. Um, AI taking jobs. Um, I think th in this industry with one of the big problems, and we can talk about it as well, with, with like is the recruitment and HR and um, just retaining staff. Um, this industry is trying to fit in AI to compensate for that. And it's, it is possible to do that. The thing is, I think AI is more of a, think of it as more of a tool than a replacement, right? It, it, um, it's almost like a jack on, uh, that you use to like change your tires, jack on a car jack or a, uh, it's more like a screwdriver to unscrew things with, uh, it's a tool that enables people to be more efficient. And I and another analogy you can think of, in my in my opinion, again, is uh, 
it will do the monotonous tasks so you don't have to. For example, ChatGPT and kids are doing these days where they will tell ChatGPT exactly what kind of essay they want to write. And ChatGPT produces that essay. Uh, but then they take that on and then they improve it. And then, you know, they save, I don't know, a day of writing. Um, same thing happens with AI where a lot of the things that if people are asking you the same questions and uh, booking should be fairly simple or your CRM needs to do something when something happens, um, AI can be smart about it. Um, and then the other side of things where AI can look at your numbers and tell you that, oh, hey, like, I think you need to increase the price of this unit or decrease the price because of X reason. So looking at data in real time, a lot of the stock trading and a lot of the accounting, a lot of the stuff that we do is done through AI, is, is done through AI bots. A lot of the public market stocks are traded by bots that are pre-trained al algorithms. Um, uh, and that doesn't mean that stockbrokers are out of business. It just means that the AI suggests that you should look at the stock at this price, and here's a reason, and then the analyst will look at it. Uh, yeah, uh, if there was an analyst that does just does that, um, uh, in, in the stock market that just focuses on looking at stocks and creating reports, maybe that could be replaced by AI. But, you know, we're a bit too early. And I think in this space, in our space, we're far more early than the other industries. I would say at least five, five to seven years early. So right now it's nice to have AI and people are heading in the right direction, but it needs to have a utility and it's not gonna take jobs, it's gonna be more, uh, make your uh, staff more efficient. Um, so that's that's my take. And there always has to be a human element involved in, you know, selling or leasing or whatever it is. Uh, and uh, and yeah, uh, that's again, that's that's my take. I don't know if it makes sense. I don't know what you what your thoughts are. So you, you're 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 saying uh, I want to summarize what you just said, right? It's not a replacement. It's an enhancement. Yeah. Right of, of the you know end user experience. So my my take on this is that I, I think we've been uh, scared by technology throughout history. Well, industrial revolution, right? Came yep. to us. We're scared. Like, hey, this is gonna take, you know, the humans' jobs. Our yep. equation, you know, we survive as a uh, we not just only survive, but we thrived, right? Through the industrial revolution, the. You know the internet revolution, all, all the revolutions that we had. You know, major revolutions we had in technology, in a history we survived all of them. I think we're gonna survive this one too. I think the fear is being escalated because why? Because this AI and the technology nowadays improves exponentially, right? So it moves yep. at a, a lot faster rate than the industrial revolution and the other previous revolutions moved, and yep. we humans were pretty conservative in nature. So yep. it's kind of hard to adapt and keep up with that pace. But I think we will eventually because we're, you know, we're still around. If we're not going to be adapting, we, we're just not going to be around for too long, I believe. You know, the <laughs> machines are going to kill us, right, eventually. But we're, we're not at that point yet. We're, I, I, the way I see, you know, the next 10, 15, 50 years, I see, like you, you know, like you described, the experience is going to get better. Things are going to get yep. better. The society as a whole is going to, uh, produce so much abundance for everybody that everybody is going to benefit. And I don't see like, you know, 10, 15% of the population being out of the jobs because of AI. I just see like things just being cheaper, more, more, uh, more accessible to population than they are today through the development of technology, even in a third world countries, you know, countries that uh, are, you know, now below poverty lines, I guess, you know, as we define poverty here in the United States, let's say. But at the same time, uh, it's also to be acknowledged that in Africa right now, the life expectancy, it's at the level that Europe, Western Europe had in the 1950s. That's mm -hmm. not long ago, that's only 70 years ago in a big scheme of things, that's not a whole lot. When mm -hmm. you're thinking about their life expectancy is what it was in Western Europe 
in the 1950s. I think that's an amazing statistic. And that te takes that there is thanks to technology, free market solutions, and capitalism, really, which I, I think you know we're hearing a lot of uh, people uh, demonizing it. I, I mm -hmm. just think it, the people are getting it wrong. There's actually a lot of opportunity out there, and we have to be open to it and you know embrace it, right? Yeah. Uh, the free market solutions and, and technology. So that's kind of my take, a long take. No, that makes sense. I completely agree. I think no one should be afraid of AI or anything taking jobs. I think it creates new types of jobs, one. And number two, it, it pushes creativity in the as a whole in the society. Um, and it takes a lot of time to sort of be okay. Like, okay, this is the new... For example, I don't know, maybe when people were moving around in horses then the railway comes in and you know the railway is this new thing and <clears throat> you don't have to push a cart with a horse or whatever um then then now okay new jobs have been created a new technology has been released new jobs of, of actually the railway system itself that would probably hires a lot of people for a lot of different kinds of jobs same thing with cars when they come in, it just creates a new industry, right? Ford comes up with a car and now people are liking that um, and, and so on and so forth. Um, there'll be newer technologies, newer things, a lot of stuff that you can do with your smartphone, you had to hire people to do, right? Um, people used to hire a lot of assistants to, uh, they still do uh, an assistant to do a few things that now are done automate, uh, automatically, um, you know, and you can go to a hotel in the middle of nowhere and you can just check in with your phone. You don't need to go to the receptionist to, or, or the admin person to collect a key or whatever, like, um, Airbnb is like that, right? Just go to, to someone's house without even meeting them. And just, you open the door as well. Like who would have thought that? And then people adapt, right? So what does that create? All the technology that's been built to automate all of that stuff has labor behind it. So there's new jobs being created, new type of jobs. And it'll push the society to be a bit more, to learn new skill sets. But that's not happening in the near future. Uh, and strictly speaking about multifamily, <clears throat> I think at the end of the day, the way they everyone sees it is like, is it more profitable if I buy a new technology? Is it going to increase my NOI? Is it going to overall increase the efficiency of my labor? And if yes, then show me what it is. And that's sort of what people are looking for. And that's sort of what we see as well in the near future. But I don't, I don't think any multifamily <clears throat> CMO looks at it, oh, I don't need to hire another marketing person to create branding emails or things like that. Oh, I'm just going to hire this tool that creates a sample or gives me a few templates and sample emails or uh, does a bit of the work on well, in terms of marketing. And I'm going to use that tool to be more efficient, to market better, to have better messaging, better have an understanding of what people are searching on Google in my area, things like that. So I think it's an enabler rather than like, oh, a, re a complete replacement. Totally. Um, <clears throat> my next question for you, Faizan, is what do you think you will make a tech company a good partner for a, a multifamily management firm? What, what are some characteristics that will make a company uh, like yours a great partner for a multifamily firm? I think one of the main things... Um, is that, and I always tell this to our sales staff as well, <clears throat> you have to be upfront and super honest with what you can deliver, a, like almost under promise and over deliver. Having, being a partner working with the team is more important than selling a product, working with the team that you're selling to. So being involved, having a good relationship, understanding their problems, and then seeing if it's a good solution, if it's a good fit, um, is is a good way to going about going about like selling your tech product to the multi-domain industry. Um, and 
understanding the pain points is super important. So it's very important for companies to have domain expertise. And how do you do that? You have to talk to people or hire the right people who understand the industry and who are able to speak the lingo, speak the multifamily language uh, to, um, to sell the product or to, to make sure that the product is actually, um, it's actually a good product that people love and they tell their friends um, about it, tell other people about it. I think that's a good measure of a product is when the word of mouth spreads faster than your marketing, your whatever sales or marketing. Um, so um, yeah, I, I think there's no real silver bullet. The real way is to talk, understand. And a lot of people have requests, customization requests and so on. Um, listening to that and building around it, um, I think it's is important. You mentioned hiring people that understand multifamily, right? Uh, I'm going to take this a step further. It's something that I predicted that we will see more of in the market in 2023. Um, and what I predicted was that more companies, whether they're management companies or you know on a, a service provider side like yours, they will be looking for people that are very well known in the industry, let's just call them influencers for the sake of the term, right? Like a general mm -hmm. term, industry influencers, they will partner with them in such a, you know, in some way, shape or form, either hiring them full time or do like partnerships, like, you know, be sponsors on their events, things of that nature to attract attention. Because at the end of the day, what you need, you know, in order to sell is attention, the attention of your potential customer. How do you get sure. their attention? You may be, hire or you partner with someone that already has the attention on them, right? Sure. And they, they, you don't have to create that attention from zero. You you yeah. partner with someone that, you know, aligns with, you know, with your goals, maybe, you know, yeah. you, you gotta find some alignment, right? There, an industry influencer, and you make that happen. Uh, is that something that, you know, you think that the industry will embrace, is embracing right now? Is it gonna be a, a, a thing anytime soon? Uh, partnering, yeah. with, you know, influencers to, to push their product and get the message message out. Yeah, there's there's a sort of like a gray side to this influencer stuff. Um, so we'll have to like a, take a step back and look at why this happens, right? I was reading a report not so long ago and it said 63% of CXOs or CTOs, CEOs, CMOs, COOs, they were they made decisions based on some kind of recommendation and uh, when purchasing software. So 63% of them. So that means a lot of the decisions in multifamily, um, and I'm just talking about multifamily, the 63% uh, are made by someone telling someone that this product is good or they seeing the product somewhere and then realizing it's good. And that someone is basically uh, the consultant, influencer, whoever you're you're talking about. So this industry is very relationship based. When you look at the B two C in B business to customer industry, a lot of the products are pushed through Instagram. You might might have seen um, Shark Tank or uh, what's the other one? There's another one, right? There's two of these, Dragons Den, yeah. So you might have seen that in Shark Tank and Dragon's Den where people come in and the first question is like, okay, what is your sales? Okay, and how did you get your sales? And a lot of these B2C guys is like, oh, we got it through uh, influencer marketing or Instagram followers, organic. And then, you know, they all, all clap for it because a lot of people, especially, uh, for example, like a women's... Uh, uh, makeup products, women's and men's wake up, uh, uh, makeup products. These are, you see someone using it or in, uh, someone who you follow uses it and you want to use it. People are generally, majority of the people are followers rather than leaders. Um, and there's a whole debate about it and I've read a lot of books around it. Uh, but uh, yeah, I mean, then in my opinion, influencers are really big in other fields and that is sort of like moving towards the b2b side of things where people are buying products through these consultants for example hubspot which is 
the second biggest CRM after Salesforce, I guess, has more influencers than Salesforce, has more people who implement HubSpot agencies and so on. So let's say I go to an agency and I'm like, oh, I need to set up a CRM for my 100 person company or a 50 person company. And then they'll say, oh, why don't you use HubSpot? Because I know how to implement it and it's really awesome. So they've sold it, uh, sold the product to you. And because you trust them, you take the leap. I think influencer um, uh, uh, marketing or influencer um, decision making based off of what the influencer says is big, still big. It's currently actually pretty big in multifamily and it will get bigger and bigger and you'll start seeing more and more of these people um, coming along because people want more information and influencers get them that information. How about the aspect of leveraging social media to help with marketing and sales via influencer message? Because uh, I'll tell you as a you know user, like I'm a huge LinkedIn user. Uh, yeah. I do post a lot of content too, but yeah. you know, I'm a user, I read. You know, I go up and down my feed all the time. Sure. You see, it's it's not a lot of uh, it's not a lot of creative that I'm seeing right there. Everything's pretty sanitized. And this could go for, you know, for the other side, for management companies too. When they advertise jobs, for example, all you see is like, is the same Canva. Someone changes a few fonts and colors. Yeah. A lot of times I, I I look at those Canvas and I confuse, you know, company A for company C because they look so much alike. So when everything becomes so san uh, so sanitized, mm -hmm. you know, I, I call this uh, plastic or soulless content. It has no soul. How, how, how do you how do you stand up from the crowd? And this goes for, you know, this goes for tech products instead having a different more more of a different approach, like have someone actually do something fun, like do a fun video about something in context. Right. Maybe something that doesn't even have anything to do with your product. Uh, you know, kind of like the, you know, kind of like I, I just saw the video last night uh, with for the, you know, dozen of time, whatever, with Steve Jobs, when he explained his campaign in 19, I think 97 was, uh, mm -hmm. with, uh, you know, they, they took all those, you know, genius live, you know, or that, you know, with Muhammad Ali and uh, Einstein, and they, they weren't talking about the Apple products. They were just yeah. talking about those great people. And yep. how great of an ad was, you know, impactful. So it's yep. something like that that's already been done. It's been very impactful. Like take, you know, someone, an industry influencer, a face that's known and put something, create something together. It doesn't have to be expensive, millions of dollars. Like literally make some videos. You, you could do a lot of videos on, you know, on your on your own phone and just like literally no editing, raw videos. I actually had a guests on my show they're sharing with me you know one of my guests you know she owns a marketing company and she shared with me she said the most viewed video that i had on instagram because she's you know big on instagram she does a lot of instagram it's like i film myself with you know with a phone no editing and i just put it out there and that was like when crazy like almost viral in, in an industry right. that that type of product right uh do, do you think that there's value in that like do you see uh, companies like yours or management companies even like embracing different you know a different approach when it comes to marketing of their products wherever they're selling yeah i think there's there's a couple of things um so you write about steve jobs and and, and i'll chat um i'll share my um uh thoughts on that um with if you look at the the market the social media marketing that happens in the B two C arena, um, and if you if the B two B side of things tries to do the same thing, it usually does not really work that well. For example, IBM selling um, big mainframe computers. If they start doing ads, um, or some kind of creative ads, um, it won't influence CEOs to make the decision and buy a million dollar mainframe. I think there, I, I think, so what, what back in the day, what people probably uh, got to was, and, and Steve Jobs was a genius, right? Microsoft was selling products like here's a laptop, it's $200 or my, here's a desktop, sorry, at $200. And it has 
this, 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 and this. It does this, this, and this, and this. And these are features and benefits. And you were inundated with these <clears throat> ads. Or if you go to a Microsoft store or wherever, you see like all these people telling you features. What Steve Jobs said is like people are busy. They will buy products not because of what it does, but because of why why the company does it. The why is important. And I think a lot of people have talked about, there's a lot of research. He was a genius in terms of him or Nike or um, there was a quite a few awesome products back then. And I don't see them right now, but there were quite a few of them. What they sold was like, we believe in uh, changing the norm, the status quo, uh, pushing the human race. We believe in the future. Do you believe? Okay, you do. Buy my product. Microsoft was like, this product has got the best service, the fastest and this and that, an Intel processor or whatever, IBM processor, this chip, that chip, and people, it was too much for people. Nike does the same thing. We believe in athletes who come from the slum and make it to the world, like the, the biggest stage. Do you believe in that? Oh yeah, I am I believe in that. Let's buy Nike uh, running shoes or whatever it is. I think, um, so the, the concept that you're talking about is the why. I buy products because I think the person running the show or the team running the show uh, buys, it believes in something that I believe in. And when the belief, uh, it's it's almost like this puzzle that it, it is completed, and then you buy it, and then um, and I've seen that happen actually when in our in our in my experience as well, where I've just told people I'm going to do this, and it's and I believe this is the future. Um, we don't have all the things that you're asking for, but we're gonna. And this is where we're heading, and people would give me sign like annual contracts with us. It, because they believe that we could do it and they believed what we believed and, and we were not faking it. And that's how I'm saying it right now. It's like, I think AI will definitely take a lot of the effort out of the this industry and that's what we sell. But I, we truly believe that. Um, so um, to, to in terms of social media, the second point that you mentioned, uh, yeah, ads are really bad. Uh, definitely need some creativity. Uh, copy pasting ads and almost like these um, uh, like creativity is very hard to measure in an interview when you're hiring someone um, so uh, you just look at their work and you hope that this works works out so uh, there's no real again I, I would say like there's no real um, right way to to figure that piece out content is very hard to make viral. You cannot predict virality. Sometimes you can push 10 videos and one video would work and you don't really know the reason. Some people like some of those stuff. So I think the goal is to push as much content as possible, but really good relevant content and not just very salesy type, like marketing type of uh, content. Um, that's That's what I think. And yeah, there is a gap in terms of, the the quality of these ads or videos or, or social media content that we see on LinkedIn, especially in the B2B space and multifamily space. Not a lot of companies have done a really awesome job. That's why they heavily rely on their sales team. <clears throat> well, Zeng, we talked a, a lot about, you know, the current situation. Uh, I, I like to talk a little bit about the future, right? And get your sure. take on that. Uh, so what are you see? for future trends in prop tech for multifamily. Uh, basically, how how would the, uh, the industry anticipate market demands and staying ahead, ahead of the curve? Yeah, I think as I, uh, if you talk to a lot of the VC firm, venture capitalist uh, firms that are investing in bigger companies, um, they are mostly going towards automation. They're mostly investing towards automation. So you can take Andreessen Horowitz, who was A16Z, the guy who started Netscape. Um, uh, probably one of the big, um, maybe the top 10 biggest VCs in Silicon Valley. 
um, they're they're investing heavily on smart living, for example, uh, in multifamily space. Um, they're investing heavily in AI products. They're investing heavily in integration products. Like a lot of, in our space, in the multifamily space, none of the property manager softwares talk to each other. And it's a pain. Integration is a pain um, in the behind. And it's um, people, that's the first question people ask. So I think solving problems and making it seamless so you have more choice is where it's going and automating things and centralizing things. A lot of the stuff is decentralized. And you might have seen this word thrown around a lot where we want to centralize everything and, and in the multifamily space. So I think in the future, things will be more centralized. There'll be more AI implemented with in uh, either the top of the funnel or bottom of the funnel. Um, turnover for renters um, would be less because a lot of the focus is on community building and making it a really good experience for people to not leave. All of us, almost it would feel like um, a home that you'd never want to leave uh, because of the amenities and the social aspect of it. So a lot of apps, a lot of things are being built which connect the residents um, together. Um, also, 63% um, of the population uh, of millennials are, are uh, uh, 63 percent renters are millennials and millennials rent so and they like tech so once in the next five to ten years there'll be more technology more automation more things that will excite people to go live in a building which has a thermostat that that is smart enough to turn off when you leave for work or whatever it is some kind of smart living application. Plus you get to know your neighbor. Plus if you're looking for a place, another place, it's super easy to get one. Um, if you have a question about maintenance it gets solved right away, everyone's just going to work on customer experience or so whatever tech is being built. is going to take over because these older companies and no offense to Yardi and all these guys, but their legacy, if you look at their, Look at the software. The design itself looks like someone Bill Gates made it in the eighties. Uh, so, um, I think a lot of the focus would be on newer things. The users, the end users, would be young. The 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 uh, the, the customers, the renters are going to be younger. Uh, and the mindset will be very different. And I'm seeing that with Gen Zs as well. I'm a millennial myself, but seeing Gen Z's have a way different way of how they do banking, how they do, how, what kind of car they want to buy. What are their preferences for a car? Um, like how they, what kind of apartment they want to live in. The, the, the way they see it is very different. Um, so you have to adapt. And I think a lot of technology will work towards that. Fantastic. Uh, remains to be seen. I, I think I agree with, you know, the overwhelming majority of what you just said. Um, in closing, Faizan, I, I want to give you the opportunity to say something you didn't have the chance to say during the conversation okay. or to maybe answer a question you wish I would have asked and I didn't. <laughs> Uh, no, I think we had a really nice conversation. You had a very, uh, really good questions. Um, appreciate you taking the time. Uh, I don't do a lot of podcasts. I mostly like to visit people in person, whether at NAA events or regional events like TA um, and so on. So um, yeah, and I think uh, I don't have anything else to add other than uh, to have like a shameless plug where uh, it's, your listeners can check out LetHub. So it's L-E-T-H-U-B dot C-O. And uh, would love to have a conversation and learn about um, how AI can help. Um, and uh, I guess like a question um, that that comes to mind is maybe like a question for you, if, if you don't mind answering. Not at all. Is, um, what, what motivated you to start this, uh, this podcast and uh, how, uh, like, what are, what would be your main goal for this, uh, for this podcast? So what, I'm going to start with what motivated me. First of all, um, I wanted to speak in public. 
And although this is not public speaking, but he puts me in front of a camera, sure. he forces me to make mistakes. I make I, I make mistakes all the time, but sure. he forces me to look at the mistakes that I made and try to do better the next time. So this is mm -hmm. one. Uh, the second one was uh, I want to learn from the best. And one of the ways to learn is, you know, to listen to podcasts. And there's also another way, right? To have your own podcast and invite the best podcast. <laughs> listen to what they have to say and actually learn and educate. So it's an educational thing for me. Uh, the other uh, the other reason is I noticed that for the most part, if you look at a lot of the podcasts in the industry, you know, they're being built around, you know, we're selling a product. Mm -hmm. Say that, you know, your company says, well, we heard that this, you know, vehicle, is, it's, it's very impactful creating mm -hmm. a podcast. So we're just going to pay someone, an employee or non-employee, pay them to do a podcast and it's mm -hmm. going to be our podcast, right? Mm -hmm. um, I'm not affiliated. Of course, you know, I have a day job. I work for a company, for a management company currently. Uh, I'm not, uh, but it's not my management company podcast. It's my own. I could have, you know, I could speak up my mind, which I already do on social mm -hmm. media, mainly on LinkedIn. Uh, mm -hmm. I'm not the type of person that, you know, you will see one face, like one uh, part of me, when we have a public conversation and you will see a different me when you meet me in person is what you see is what you get all the time. Uh, right. I think our industry needs more conversations, more very honest conversations about the challenges that we're facing, uh, where, where are we heading and everything. And I, I want to make this a platform to have those type of conversations. I'm varnished, you know, uh, not sanitized, uh, not, not to say, you know, oh, oh, all the nice things and actually not touch on uh, pain points, on things that I want to ask questions that everybody in our audience wish they could have asked. And for some reason, they're afraid because they might think, you know, their company is going to punish them for asking, you know, for daring to ask right. the question. Or, you know, they're, they're shy or maybe it's not their thing to ask. I want to do that. I want to ask questions of my guests on behalf of my audience, uh, like right. uh, challenging questions and interesting intriguing to topics to bring to the uh, to the table to the conversation to make the space a little better that's uh that's kind of the long answer no makes sense no uh, totally makes sense that's good for you for doing that <clears throat> i don't think there's a lot of candid conversations going on i think yours is very um it's almost natural organic and candid open discussing issues that are sort of under the rug of issues so uh yeah no for sure that i i i had a great time chatting i think uh again i uh, thank you for inviting us and um you know talking about that hub and so on i appreciate uh you taking the time with us uh today faizan yeah. everybody thank you for watching us today uh this is multifamily chronicles i'm your host adrian danila and i hope to see you back here soon have a great day